I feel like I've been bamboozled by Riot. I made a lot of jokes recently about Yasuo and how anytime Riot prints a card with stun on it, people go nuts and say maybe Yasuo is finally viable. And we had a good time, we had a good laugh, and it felt like Malphite was falling into that trap. However, it seems like Riot was saving some of the better stun cards for later because today we got some reveals including some stun options and some recall options and there's actually good stuff in here so the way that this video is going to go is we're going to cover the cards i'll talk about their individual strengths and then i'm going to address the elephant in the room which is yasuo and then i want to talk about other potential deck types as well so let's start with the cards first up we have solari sunhawk this is a two cost two three with daybreak of stun the strongest enemy now you'll notice on this graphic below the Sunhawk is Blinding Crest. It shows up as a skill. This is the skill that the Daybreak effect creates. Think of it very similar to like the Leona effect as well. So you don't get the little yellow circle, the little icon that lets you know that a skill is coming because it's a Daybreak effect, but it does in fact create a skill. Now, the card itself, I actually am a really big fan of as far as Daybreak options go. Normally, your old Daybreak option was the 3-2 that for one round is essentially a 3-6 and that was great at stalling and it was also a good on curve play if you wanted to be proactive but Sunhawk gives you the option to have an impact late in the game and the way stuns usually work the later the game goes the more impact your stun actually has because you're preventing more damage or getting rid of a higher impact blocker so Sunhawk here is actually a great late game option but also for me, the big deal here is this is also a body that survives Avalanche and Ravine and other effects that deal two damage. So this, in my opinion, does the job of stalling and soaking damage and also a little bit of survivability early on very, very well. So for a common card, I'm a big fan of Solari Sunhawk and I would love to play it in decks where you are wanting to stun or play Daybreak. I think it will end up finding a home in both of those. Next up, we have Eye of the Rahorek. I might be mispronouncing that, but this is a five cost Targon landmark. It says countdown one, stun the two weakest enemies, but daybreak, and this is a big deal, summon a copy of me with countdown two. So you don't get the immediate effect, but because it's a countdown effect, it's going to occur at round start. This actually is very powerful even without stun synergy this is a really powerful card for proactive decks because this allows you to set up wonderful open attack opportunities and then if you're playing the daybreak version as well this also can be very powerful because it is allowing you to maybe set up your own open attack or stall the next round and set up a great open attack the following round because you're gonna have the one that's a countdown one and one that's a countdown two so you're going to get two full rounds worth of these kind of stun effects. This is a very powerful card. The other reason that this is a huge deal with that daybreak effect is that when you summon a copy of this, that's another five cost landmark. So the daybreak of the eye of Ra Horek is 10 mana worth of landmarks that you've played for a five mana investment. So when you're talking about trying to level up Malphite, this almost does it on its own. You could play one of these and just have played Blue Sentinel, the blue buff unit, and had that die, and you've leveled up your Malphite. So before, all of my assessments about Malphite were a, a bit clunky because you were potentially, or theoretically at the time that he was revealed, going to have to run a bunch of these little landmarks to rack up your value, or you were going to have to play things like Talia to start copying them etc etc but just the existence of i alone makes malphite incredibly palatable this is a very good card but again for me i think the standout here is that it sets up open attacks really well even without any other stun synergy so taking away cards like blade twirler cards like yasuo etc like this is a solid card so i'm a big fan of i of the rahoric obviously daybreak decks i think would also like this card as well it does compete with the you know board wide buff daybreak card in that five drop slot but i still think that your ability to 
stun some enemies it's actually really interesting because when you think about nightfall they get moonlight affliction which silences two enemies and potentially makes it so that they can't block and this in many ways is like the opposite end of that much like we have zenith blade and pale cascade that used to be mirrors of each other but one was daybreak and one was nightfall now obviously due to card balance adjustments they're not quite mirrors anymore but that was their intent uh, it makes me wonder if the eye of rahorak here was the counter point right the counterbalance to moonlight affliction at one point during development because they both have that very similar feel but they do it in different ways it's it's neat i like it but the card is powerful i i expect to find a home for it one way or the other because again being able to set up open attacks with this i think is going to be a pretty big deal now the next card that we're going to look at is a five cost ionia card it's a fast spell by the name of shadows of the past and this says recall each ally and summon a living shadow in its place this is interesting the art obviously you know calls forth calls to mind zed because of the living shadow interactions uh, this is interesting to me because it can be used in a number of different ways but all of them are also potentially a bit clunky on the one hand you can use it to save a bunch of your units if somebody plays like a ruination you can bounce them all back to your hand and you net end up with a, a bunch of cards that you can replay after the fact you can use this as uh, like a combat trick to deal more damage if you're swinging with a, a bunch of one ones then this effect will bring the one ones back and then they become replaced by the living shadows hitting for potentially three as well i, I think about you know maybe this is going to be something that's really good with irelia we haven't seen irelia yet and i had joked about how maybe irelia and zed will be a deck because we did get teased blade we know that she's going to do something with blades that was a token card that we know is part of her archetype and art and what have you so maybe there's going to be some deck where you play a bunch of blades and then you recall the blades into living shadows or something i don't know but i think the biggest letdown here is because it's all allies and not like all followers for example this doesn't make leveling zed that much easier if you're doing it at the fast speed because zed won't be there to see the living shadows connect with the nexus so the only way this really helps you out in that regard is if you've got again maybe a bunch of one ones and you play shadows of the past to get living shadows and then you replay zed so that he can see those shadows maybe hit the nexus so that helps in that regard but i don't know this is a. Uh, this is a card that feels like it's a piece to a puzzle but the puzzle hasn't been solved yet there's a lot of potential in it it's certainly a powerful effect but it's going to take i think some deck building and certainly a lot of testing to figure out if this actually has a home or not i think we have to see the rest of this set before i can really pass judgment on this card the next card we have is a four cost sharima card this is a 5-3 Profiteer, and it says, When I'm summoned, create a lucky find in hand. And that's it. But I like this card because this is a 5-3, so it's helping you with reputation. It helps you with your Sivir decks, and the lucky find is also great because of the ability to get those keywords, which you care about in Sivir decks. I think that this card is going to compete with Bakai Sandspinner in some decks for the slot obviously Sandspinner I think has the more consistently powerful effect but if you care about generating extra cards or you care about keywords then Profiteer could be a better choice potentially Profiteer certainly makes sense in uh, like I said Sivir decks because once she levels up you want to be granting overwhelm to your entire board but it, it might find a home in other places. I think it's a great expedition card. Not that that's a huge sell, but I do like Profiteer. And I think that it will take some testing. I think Sandspinner probably wins most of the time. I think the benefit of dictating trades is too big of a deal. But Profiteer, with that lucky find, could, pun intended, find a lucky home. 
All right, next up, we have Dancing Droplet. And I love this card. So Dancing Droplet is a one cost Ionia follower. This is a one one and it has a tune. It has elusive and it says when I'm recalled, draw one. So you get a one cost one one, but it's got two keywords and a passive effect that when it's recalled, you draw one. I love this card. Like the art is already adorable. This little droplet of green water that's also a bird or whatever it, it's just cute but th this this card does a lot of stuff the fact that it's an ionia one drop with a tune i think is a pretty big deal and the fact that it has elusive is a huge deal because you, one you're already in ionia anyway you want those elusive units but also this gives you in certain cases maybe ways to trigger plunder maybe ways to just get some chip damage in i don't know the, this card feels like it does a lot for a one drop. And then once you go to the third part, right? Never mind the attune, never mind the elusive, the when I'm recalled to draw one, well, suddenly uh, it makes me want to start playing Conspirator again. You know, before it used to be you'd play Conspirator so that you could replay your two ones so that they got elusive again, or you could replay your Omen Hawk to buff your elusives. There was a time when Conspirator was a, a go-to in an elusive aggro deck. But then as time went on and it got nerfed, it obviously is a 2-2 now as well. That kind of hurts it. It just fell out of popularity. But being able to replay Dancing Droplet is a pretty big deal. Because again, uh, when it's recalled, you draw but also it has a tune. Like I can't get over the fact that this has that recall effect and a tune in a region where you also wanna be playing spells and care about them. Uh, this makes me want to potentially play Homecoming in a bunch of decks. I think that Homecoming is on the cusp of being really, really good. There was a time when four mana Will of Ionia was a staple in just about every Ionia deck. And this could be something that pushes it in that direction. This card makes me want to deck build. I think that's the biggest compliment. Whether or not this ends up being competitively viable, I don't think matters. I think that this is a win for game design because this card, this one cost common, makes me want to deck build. And that is, that is a huge compliment. I love this card. I absolutely adore this card. And that's, again, not even counting like Yasuo stuff. You could certainly start considering uh, fun self-bounce combos with things like monastery because maybe you want to use monastery to get back your concussive palms maybe you want to use monastery to now get back your dancing droplet and maybe you want to use monastery to start further buffing up your blade twirlers and things this i think this has a lot of potential the last card is maybe i think the most impressive card in this list this card is really good so we have a three cost Sharima follower by the name of Merciless Hunter. And this is a four, three fearsome and on play grant an enemy vulnerable. I am a huge fan of hired gun and Bilgewater. I was since launch. I think that that card because it granted vulnerable permanently was a bit underplayed at times. I think it's a really powerful effect. And this is everything hired gun was, but more this card is nutty. You're going to look at this because it's in Shurima. You're going to see the word vulnerable and you're going to think Renekton and you're not going to be wrong. This is obviously intended to help out Renekton strategies, but even without Renekton, even if I am not playing Renekton, this card is good. The three cost four, three with a relevant keyword is playable by itself. We see that in things like uh, Ballista, for example. But the fact that I not only get to potentially dictate trades, but also it's permanent. It's grant an enemy vulnerable. It's not even till end of round is a huge deal on a card with fearsome because I can also then maybe use some of my smaller units to pull away the fearsome blockers so that this pushes its damage through. This card does everything you want to do on a three drop. Uh, it hits for four as it's just so good. I. Uh, I I would have considered playing this card as a, a three cost three three with the same keyword and the same effect. This card is pretty good. Now, Sharima, I think kind of needed the help. You're gonna hear some people say, well, you know, you had uh, researchers at three and you're not wrong, but the reality is 
there weren't many good aggressive three drops in Sharima before. Uh, they got the best one drops in the game for aggressive decks. I think that's an, an easy, you know, uncontested thing. They've got some pretty good two drops, but their three drops, you are usually pulling in stuff from other regions. This is nutty. This is this is such a good play into a turn four Renekton, but it's just a good play on turn three, even without a Renekton. I love this card, so they will find a home. You'll see this in a deck somewhere. All right. With that being said, now it's time to address the elephant in the room, which is Yasuo, because there's a lot of stuff in this set of cards that says the word stun, and that's rightfully going to get folks talking about Yasuo. And the good news is I think that Yasuo is uh, maybe more playable now, but we actually... I could envision a scenario where you play the Yasuo deck, if you will, where you play Ionia and Targan and you don't even play Yasuo. I could see it being Leona Malphite because make no mistake about it, those two stun cards are also Daybreak cards and that also matters. But let's think ahead of ourselves. Let's talk about why Yasuo has historically struggled and what the pros and cons of like Yasuo decks are as a strategy in general. The issue is, is that all of the value from the play style that Yasuo wants is temporary. And so you have to capitalize on it. So what I mean by that is, is that if you stun a unit, it's a very powerful play for that round. But if you don't capitalize on it, then all you did was buy yourself time. And it's the same thing with recall. You can recall a unit and that's a very powerful play for that round. That really shifts the tempo of the game in your favor, but you have to be able to capitalize on it. Just stunning a unit and doing nothing else is akin to gaining life. You stopped them from attacking you. And life gain, if, if you printed a card that says gain five health and it doesn't do anything else, you're not really going to be that excited about that card. And so if you print a card that says stun a unit and then you use it to essentially gain five health, you're not excited there. I know that it doesn't say gain five health or whatever, gain X health, depending on the, the unit you're stunning, but that's all you're really doing. And recall is a bit more intensive because you're gaining health and then you're also making them sink more mana into redeveloping their board. But again, it's just a stall tactic unless you can capitalize on it. And so the issue historically with Yasuo decks has been that you kind of need a perfect storm of things to happen. Uh, and when it works, it's very satisfying, but you need to develop usually one to two early units that scale blade twirler was like the go-to and then use your stuns and your recalls to create opportunities for you to capitalize with your one to two units and they have to scale because you need them to continue to generate pressure as the game goes longer and the reason for that is because if you're just stalling to the late game and if you're not capitalizing on your windows of opportunity the problem is is that you end up running into a situation where now you're playing a control deck where you've stalled to the late game, but your late game isn't as strong as other control decks. So stalling to the late game doesn't matter if you are going to lose to a Watcher or a Feel the Rush or something that's insanely powerful. Like leveling up your Yasuo is not the same in terms of power level. Like, great, you've leveled up Yasuo and you've got three stuns in your hand, but they played Feel the Rush or the Watcher and you're just like, well... Um, They've got, they've got this level of inevitability. And so buying yourself time doesn't matter if you can't take advantage of those windows of opportunity. And usually in the past, uh, the cards that they have printed didn't help with that regard. And I think that's the biggest problem with just Yasuo in general is that Yasuo's effect just takes the temporary effects and makes them a bit more permanent. And so then at that point, it starts playing like a control deck. But again, you need to capitalize like in that interim, in that intermediary. So cards like Stunhawk are a big deal because it's a stun on a body. And it doesn't matter that it's not an impressive body. It just matters that it allows you to have something on the board to help take advantage of that opportunity. So earlier I was talking about how Yasuo decks in the past kind of needed that perfect storm, right? That perfect storm of on curve plays where if you're playing the Blade Twirler, Blade Twirler, excuse me, I'm getting excited, so bear with me here. Uh, if you play that on two and maybe you're attacking on odds, then you want that sentry on three. 
so that you get another stun in but you also get a body and you get to maybe push some damage because you've stunned one of their blockers and that's you taking advantage of that window but you kind of need that same level of consistency throughout the course of the game right so then maybe it's a, a, the palm on four where you stall them but you also make a body and then on five it's another maybe offensive stun and then you you push the damage and you kind of have to kind of keep that pace but you would historically run out of cards if you were doing that and so that's where cards like dancing droplet come in where if you're pairing it with homecoming you get the best of both worlds potentially because you are getting chip damage in with droplet helping to take advantage of these opportunities you're getting to draw more cards if you're using that for the homecoming homecoming because it's a recall and not a stun is an even bigger deal because not only are you slowing them down but you're making them reinvest their mana so it's a big mana tempo play as well so uh, cards like sunhawk and dancing droplet are a big deal to the art type and they make me more excited about yasuo than say like malphite did uh malphite also when i was talking about him yesterday i was under the impression you were going to have to fill your deck with a bunch of landmarks and so the idea of having a bunch of landmarks and having a bunch of stuns and no way to capitalize on it was rough so that's where enter eye of the rahoric where now you can literally build the deck with just eye as your your only landmark and then maybe it's blue buff and you know some other units or maybe it's i and then like one or two other landmarks or something but you can build a deck that is not landmark heavy and still consistently levels up malphite this i is so important to malphite and all of a sudden you are going to potentially have these ways to actually take advantage of the opportunities that you create with the stuns and i think that every little bit helps i think that the stars of the deck so earlier i was kind of joking about how maybe you play the yasuo deck without yasuo uh, but i think that the stars of these decks are going to be blade twirler or you know the noxus character that grows for example with fearsome i think also could if you want to do like Targon noxus I, th I think that's potentially fine if you actually want to do that um but if you're going the Aeon, you're out. I think that the real star of the deck is still going to be Blade Twirler just because you're going to have a, a critical mass of stuns now. And that card's going to grow very intensely. And so I think that that's going to be the real threat. And even more so, and the reason that I, I think that that card is a big deal overall is because, you know, I talked about maybe you play a couple of other landmarks or whatever, but even if you don't, you're going to play something that grants overwhelm and targon has access to that so whether it's through zenith's blade whether it's through the spiral stairs whatever being able to have the stuns grow your scaling threat and then also give it overwhelm like the quick attack was nice but it could still get chump blocked for days being able to with targon granted overwhelm is going to be a pretty big deal so i feel like the deck might have legs now uh, I've been making jokes about it, but I think that the strongest parts they were just like leaving till the end. And this eye is a really big deal. And I love that the additional contributions that Droplet and Sunhawk have the potential to bring make me want to get in and test it and tweak some numbers. And and again, they they just make me want to deck build. And that's one of the best things that new cards can do. But I, I I do see legitimately a scenario where maybe maybe it's uh even if it's not a Yasuo deck um it's still gonna play like a Yasuo deck but maybe there is a version that exists where you're just playing Leona Malphite and you're still trying to pump up Blade Twirler and Yasuo doesn't make the cut I don't know or maybe it's like some combination maybe it's like you know three Yasuos a Leona and two Malphites or something Malphite I think is important but if you're not running a huge number of landmarks to level him and you're not worried about doing it on curve it would make sense to maybe not run the full set i don't know that's that's part of what i want to do i want to deck build i want to test it out but i do legitimately feel like there's enough firepower now that is the right kind of firepower because uh, as i was saying before i I is a big deal because it lets you set up open attacks and the entire point of these stuns is that they create windows of opportunity that you have to capitalize on and this is the the better way to do it in my opinion so we we will see but 
that's it for this video i want to know what excites you do you want to see some yasuo content maybe that's the first thing i'll do once the set launches maybe that'll be my day one video as i will mess around with yasuo the only reason that i was hesitating is i feel like every other content creator is going to do it uh, i had been planning on zillion being my day one build around just because i love that old madman but it's been so long since I've had anything good to say about Yasuo that maybe it's time. Maybe I just owe it to Yasuo to make it happen. All right. We're going to end the video here now, though. So uh, officially, I love you. I appreciate you. And until next time, may you walk on warm sands.